Hey everyone, welcome back to another interview in the intern interview series. Today I am here with Dr. Elias Farah and he is also an SGU um, alumnus like myself. He matched into interventional radiology at University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville, Florida. And I'm super excited to chat with him today because IR is a very competitive field and well, IR is a very uncommon field. I feel like there's not too many spots available. So I'm excited to chat with him about that. So, Dr. Farah, if you, don't if you don't mind, starting with the basics, how did you wind up choosing SGU in the first place? So I had a um, hard time picking medical schools when I first started applying. You know, I got some secondaries and I ended up getting waitlisted at a few schools and, you know, things weren't looking too great. And I was like, I can wait a year, do some research, maybe go to a DO school. Um, and I didn't really know too much about DO schools at the time. So, you know, I have some family and friends who were alumni of SGU like back in the old days. Um, and they, you know, they talk about the school and I started researching it and I'm like, you know what, let's do it. I don't want to take a year off. I just want to get in there. And, you know, I went there and it was kind of like taking a sip of water out of a fire hose. Um, but all in all, I'm really glad I made the decision. Perfect. Yeah, I feel similarly. I think a lot of people choose SGU or Ross or whatever the Caribbean school may be based off of the fact that they don't want to take a year off. And the nice thing is that we do have multiple classes per year. So really, if you were like, oh, it's December and I really want to become a doctor like tomorrow, you can start in January, which is great. Um, and I think that it's nice to have that option. But um, Elias was actually one of my classmates at SGU. So we were both in the August class. Um, Starting with this whole interventional radiology thing, like first thing is first. We, in rotations, I feel like we get literally no experience whatsoever in interventional And that is 100% correct. So how did you wind up figuring out that this was the specialty that you wanted to do for the rest of your life? So it's a, it's a great story. Um, I really thought I was going to be an oncologist. I really wanted to do hemonc. So throughout my rotations, I, I was on my internal medicine rotation and I thought to myself, I don't really like this that much, but I know as you specialize, it, it gets better. And I never really felt confident in the fact that, okay, if I'll do internal medicine and not that there's nothing wrong with that, with internal medicine, it's just, I didn't really like it. Um, and I was just asking everybody, what should I do? What should I do? And I kept taking quizzes over and over again and everything was, everyone was telling me family medicine, psych, surgery. I never got a, a good answer. So I was sitting in a mall in Atlanta where I was doing my rotations um, and I was talking to one of my friends and she goes, you should look at interventional radiology. I go, what the heck is that? <laughs> so <laughs> and this is I'm in Googling, third, right? excuse me? This is in what year, third year? This is third year, correct. Okay. This is third year. Um, and I had no idea what it was. So I started looking into it and I was like, this is pretty cool looking, you know? So one week I had a, I had a little bit of time in between rotations. So I went home and I started looking, you know, at hospitals around here that would maybe let me come in and shadow. And I had my dad ask around and I finally found a doctor who let me come and shadow him, an interventional radiologist here in Jacksonville. And I went in there and I saw a bunch of procedures get done. And I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And this was about three weeks before ERAS, where I really had all my internal medicine teed up. Yeah. Or excuse me, three months before ERAS opened up, not three oh, weeks. Um, my God. <laughs> and, yeah, no, not three weeks, usually three months. Yeah, three months. Um, so it's three months before ERAS, and I had all my IM stuff pretty much teed up. My IM personal statement, my IM letters, and I'm like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I completely changed. I completely switched it up. I canceled all my electives um, for medicine, and I was like, I have to find an interventional radiology rotation. So how do we go about that? I ended up getting very lucky finding one and I ended up getting, I was lucky that not to get a letter and get some research and it was a long process and a lot of the people from SGU, like a lot of the faculty and the advisors were saying, it's not going to happen. You should just go into diagnostic radiology or you should just do medicine or there's basically no shot. Yeah. And didn't really like hearing that. And honestly, it's, it feels really nice to be able to say that I matched into it. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. And I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that, like, you kind of did it, to, like, even though you were told no, because I know even for, like, you'll be able to empathize with this as well as you were interested in internal medicine, like, we're told, like, you know, community programs give you the best shot, like, don't really bother applying to university programs, like, we don't even really hear much about the, the letter, you, the chairman's letter that you need, because most programs that require it are university programs. 
And so yeah. I'm also very happy that I didn't listen to that advice because here I am at a university program. Here you are in interventional radiology, despite the fact that we are both told not to do either of those things. Your three months be right before ERAS were probably very stressful and a world. Oh my goodness. Yes, yeah. very much so. So you wound up getting a letter and you said that you got some research. Did you get some research in interventional radiology or was it in a different field? So I did. So <laughs> I'll, I'll speak on the research first. I was lucky enough yeah. that my, the tutoring company that I work for, um, the, one of the, the CEO of the company is basically an interventional radiologist from Harvard. Okay. Um, and you know, I, I didn't really know that before I started working there. And then I kind of started looking into him and I realized that. So I just kind of messaged him and I was like, Hey, I know you're an IR. Like I'm interested in going into IR. Do you maybe have any kind of research opportunities that, and he goes, yeah, actually I, I do. And we worked on a little project, um, about benign prostatic hyperplasia and some new interventional radiology treatments for it. And I got published. I, sent it into the SIR, which is basically like their, their annual meeting that they had in Seattle. And it got canceled, so I never got to, pre to present it, but it was cool, I got my name published and I got it on a piece. It was just something to show that I had an interest in the field, even though I only had three months to get something. But that's always advice I give students. Like if you can't find research, just put your name out there. Start e emailing everybody in the hospital. Everybody that you can talk to, be like, is there any research? Because your name on something, if you're an OB and you do something about heart disease and medicine, that's still better than nothing. Agreed. Um, yeah. yeah. I actually, it's funny you mentioned that because my, um, the only thing I've ever published is actually from my pediatrics rotation, which I obviously don't plan to take care of any children as long as I live, but, um, unless they're my own children, but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it doesn't matter what the research is in. I don't think it's and just that's great. You, that's great. For and a competitive great people, it's, it's important to just have it to begin with. Of um, course. So that being said, do you feel like you would have matched into IR without research or is it pretty much a requirement for IR? So no, that's a great question. And I don't think, I still think I would have matched without the paper. Um, maybe getting the interview would have been tougher, but once I got to the interview and the interviews are way more personable, it's more one-on-one. -on -one. It's really just getting to know you. It's not really breaking down your resume. It's really just, can I get along with you? Do I like you as a person? I kind of explained to them why I got interested in IR. And once you tell them like, I didn't have time to get research because I decided this literally three months ago, they actually do understand. Yeah. Um, maybe getting looked at if you're, if you're, if they're between two people to give them an interview and one person has a paper and one person doesn't, that might give you the upper hand. But in reality, I think I would have matched without that paper. Okay. It definitely helped though. It definitely helped. Yeah. So that being said, like you weren't, it obviously shows that you need to be open-minded when you're doing your clinical rotations because you can change your mind at absolutely any point. Of course. Um, but I think a lot of students tend to ask too, like they know they're interested in either IR or radiology or even just uh, any competitive field, like early on in medical school. Do you have any advice on what you did in basic sciences? Did it contribute to you, you know, having a strong application when it, it came time to apply to IR? at such like a crazy point in your life? Well, I will say that the harder you push in basic sciences and the better you do on your step one gives you the better, better chances. Right, absolutely. Um, then again though, there are people who, there are IR residents who didn't do that well on step. There are IR residents who are, F, or who are IMGs, FMGs. There are IR residents who are DOs. Um, there's IR residents from all walks of life. I will say that how I did in basic sciences, I definitely think helped me get the way I did, the way I performed on step and the way I got, went through my rotations and got my letters, I think that that definitely helped. But, to, and I hope I answered your question correctly. What I did in basic sciences didn't formulate my love for IR. I really just kind of stumbled upon it. Yeah. So like in basic sciences, is there anything you did that you think made your application strong? Did you do any like outreach? Oh, you, okay. You no know research in basic sciences though, right? No, I didn't do any research because being in Grenada, there's really not much research yeah. opportunity. I know they had a little bit on the island, but for, for the most part, I really didn't do anything. Maybe when I went back home, I did a little bit of volunteering, but nothing that would have made my resume stand out. Okay. And then in terms of your clinical years, you mentioned you were interested in internal medicine. So you have letters from other specialties, other than IR, obviously, as most people do. What tips do you have to strengthen your application for IR, for those people who are currently in their third or fourth year doing their rotations? Great. That's a, that's a great question. And I, I get this a lot when people are asking, you know, what do I do to match? So the best letters to have is going to be to have an IR letter, obviously. 
the best second letter would probably be one from a diagnostic radiologist. And then after that, you're going to want either a surgeon or an internist. A surgeon, because you want them to know that you're good with your hands, and an internist, because they, they want to know if you're good at taking care of patients. Um, so either one. So I ended up using my surgery letter, but there's also, I have a medicine letter that I also could have used for different programs. And I, there are some programs that require four letters. Right. Um, so I use both. Okay. Either one will suffice. Either one, as long as it's an, as long as it's a doctor who you know writes well about you, that that goes so. I, I've yeah. had in some of my interviews, they pulled up my letter and they read it in front of me and they went through line by line and said, "What did he mean by this? Or what did she mean by that?" So they really take those letters into account. And I think if you can't get an IR, a diagnostic might be enough because I think they really do understand that finding interventional radiology rotations are very very difficult. So I think having a diagnostic letter along with the surgery or an internist would be, would suffice. Yeah. How many programs for IR are there? So there's 88 programs. Um, some of them have one spot. Some of them have two. The most I've okay. seen, the biggest one that I have that I've seen is Emory, which has four spots. Um, wow. That's the How biggest many are you one. in your class? I'm the only one. There's just one class. You are your class. Yeah. I am my Fantastic. class. Now, you technically lumped into the entire radiology class with the diagnostic, okay. but I'm the only interventional resident in my class. There's only one spot. Wow. Um, yeah, so with 88 programs, there's probably upwards of only 200 spots in the country. Um, wow. And some of them are, were pretty much out of my reach, like the Harvards and the Yales. And you know, as much as I would love to, I, I definitely had my expectations set. Yeah, um, I, I, that's what I try and enforce to people as well as, you know, even going back to this whole thing, like when you're applying, like don't limit yourself to what field you have to apply to or anything, but you do also have to be realistic. Like if you don't do great on step one or step two and you're trying to apply for something like IR or like plastics, you have to be realistic in the fact that either you need to apply for a secondary specialty or you just need to not apply, which is, I feel bad giving that advice because I want it needs to be said. Exactly it really what they want, but perhaps maybe delay your application a year or something and like get some research or get some extra experience in the field because you have to be realistic agree. with yourself on when it comes to ERAS, I think, but you know, shoot for the stars. Um, I, I agree. You shoot for the stars. And yeah. you know, I, I was very surprised. Some of the, the list of people that interviewed me, I got interviews from Texas programs like Baylor, MD Anderson. I got interviews from Emory. And all the way out from places like UCLA and Kaiser University out in California. Yeah. I don't think that the regional, the regional bias is there for IR. I think they really want just the best people or they really just want people that, you know, they are going to enjoy working with. Right. So for those of you who might be watching, like in what he's saying is like a lot of specialties that have, offer either a lot of spots or have like many different programs. Like for example, I'm in internal medicine. A lot of programs care about your ties to that specific uh, area that you're applying or interviewing at because there's so many applicants for those primary care specialties that people tend to apply everywhere even though they don't necessarily want to go there and they want to ultimately figure out who wants to be there and who's just interviewing to make sure that they match on match day. Um, whereas in IR, it sounds more like they're less concerned about if you have family ties to the area and they're more concerned about how much do you actually love radiology and they want someone who's very qualified. Exactly. Well, speaking of qualifications, the I looked at the average score for IR, and it looks like it's in the low to mid 240s, which is one of the highest averages for any specialty. In comparison, you don't have to give an exact number, but in comparison to the average score for IR, where did your score fall? Above, below, about the same? I would say definitely above, um, and I definitely needed that to get looked at because obviously it's an IMG, you know, we're definitely looked at already down a notch. So in order to do that, I was, I tried to be as many standard deviations above as I could. Um, and I knew that if I didn't, I don't think I'd have a shot. Now there are a lot of programs that don't care about set score. Um, I know a lot of residents who, you know, were low two twenties, even in the two teens I knew, I knew one resident from Emory who failed a step and he was an IR resident. Now granted, he also had like a PhD and he had all these other qualifications, but it just goes to show that the step isn't the only thing. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think that's what I try to enforce to people as well, especially now that step one is being changed to pass fail is that you are more than your number and programs I think are starting to start to see that as well. Obviously, unfortunately, they do need to narrow down applications somehow they get like 3000 applications per year, possibly not that many in IR because there are not as many programs and I think that a lot of people don't even know IR is a residency I think <laughs> a fellowship, 
Because for the longest time, I thought it was a fellowship you did through diagnostics, but uh, turns out uh, it's not. <laughs> well, it, it from this residency is only about six years old. It was only created okay. about six years ago, the integrated residency. Okay. So prior, well, I guess interventional radiology in general hasn't been around that long, but prior, is it just like a new, newer field in general, which I feel like it is, or did you used to be able to do a fellowship through di diagnostics? So IR used to be a thing back in the seventies. People used to use wires to go up and, you know, retrieve clots. It's just the technology was so crude. Right. And now we have these, we, these hybrid ORs with all these, with these crazy like x-ray fluoroscopy and, you know, right. the 3D scanners and, now the, the technology is so advanced, it's the stuff that they're doing in IR now is unlike any kind of, the progress that we've made in medicine is unbelievable, what we can do now. So back in the day, it used to be you would do diagnostic radiology, then you do a two-year fellowship at Interventional. Then they started doing where you could match into something called the ESIR, which is you get a diagnostic residency, and then halfway through, you apply for the early specialization. Then you finish out your residency doing IR, and then you only have to do a one-year independent residency at the end. Okay. And then about six years ago, they made an integrated program where you just do five years, one intern year, four radiology years, and you're done, and you're dual certified, diagnostic, and interventional. Wow, that's awesome. And I feel like, and I feel like it's nicer to just have it done as a as a residency than have to go through fellowship also. I yeah, think there's definitely pros and cons. There's definitely a lot yeah, of pros and cons. That's true. I guess having the background of diagnostics is probably extremely helpful. Although I imagine you do quite a bit, um, even as an interventional radiology uh, resident, but yeah, I, I, I I'm, that's amazing. I'm still amazed. Like I do three months prior. Like I'm just, I'm still stuck on that from like 15 minutes. <laughs> Honestly, like everyone said, don't even bother. And I was like, yeah. you know what, maybe I shouldn't bother, but all in all, I, I think I just got really blessed and really lucky. And I think I just played my cards right and got really good advice. Yeah. So in terms of you, um, your like letters of recommendation, I know you mentioned you got the IR one, obviously a little bit later. You, I'm assuming that you had strong letters in general. So even though you're applying for interventional radiology, it was very important for you to stand out in other rotations. But how did you feel like you managed to stand out in your IR rotation specifically when you finally found one? <laughs> Honestly, it was really hard to stand out because I had a lot of students who are with me from like Wash U Medicine. I had people there from like, you know, I had one from Stanford Med. I had one because I did my rotation at Emory. And Emory is one of the strongest IR programs in the country. Okay. Um, and all these guys that were there with me, like there was four students and the three of them were just outstanding applicants. And I'm like, yeah. well, I have to, so I'd get there every morning at like 6 a.m. They had like their, their pre rounds and it's not, you don't round in the sense that you go room to room. You kind of look at the cases that are posted that day and we go through each patient and say, these are their comorbidities. This is what we're doing. This is our plan. They look up the images. This is the route we're going to go. So what you have to do is you have to load up the images onto the PAC system in order to see that. And then you have to right. type in like a little HPI. So I would get there at 5.30 and for 30 minutes, I just go and do it all so that with the resident who came in there didn't have to do it. Um, just little things like that or staying later and at another case or even taking some call with some of the attendings, anything that you can do to stay there longer but not annoy them yeah, is right. what, what it takes. And it turns out that the program director here in Jacksonville, which is evidently also where I'm from, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. So going, talking back earlier about the, the, regions, the region bias, it can't hurt you, but it definitely helps you in IR. Right. Right. Um, the, the old program director for Emory, who was still in attending there, she knew the program director here at University of Florida. And on my interview, I mentioned that I had done a rotation in Emory. And he goes, oh, I know Dr. So-and-so. And I didn't have a letter from her. I had a letter from somebody else. But I said, you know, if you wanted to call her and ask her about me, I'm sure she'd be more than happy to talk. And after that interview, I walked out and I had a text from her and, and I said, just wanted to let you know, Dr. Siragusa had, had called me and I, you know, I fully endorsed you. So even if it's not a letter, any attendings, attendings know each other. True. And especially, especially in, in a smaller field like IR. Exactly. They, all the program directors know each other. So trying to make the best impression you can on everybody that you're there will go. I think that probably put me not put me up like much higher on the list. Yeah. I think nowadays too, making, I think just in general, making connections, even through social media and stuff is becoming increasingly popular, but oh, when you, especially for competitive fields, I know I heard from a urology resident, um, kind of recently, I heard from a plastics resident kind of recently, and they pretty much got, I want to say their foot in the door through networking, which is a lot of work 
in like a different way. It's not, you know, standing out on the wards, which you obviously should be doing also, but like you have to reach out to people. Exactly. You have to, you have to be like very active about what you're going after when I feel like the chances are kind of small, which I mean, I feel like in our case, like, hence us being told like not to apply, like, you know, the chance of getting into radio, uh, IR is pretty small in general. You said there's only 88 programs, 200 or so spots. So I feel like you have to be very proactive if you can make like connections. I feel like fields like this are the perfect example of how you can stand out by networking. So work on your networking skills if you're interested uh, in technology or something like another specialty that is like relatively high on the competitive competitive end of specialties in terms of applying. Um, so also I found this was so interesting when I was doing my research for this. Um, I always go on the NRMP charting the outcomes and just take a look to see what the average step score is versus like USIMGs, USMDs, USDOs, things like that. And according to the NRMP charting the outcomes document in the 2018 one was the most recent one I saw. Interventional radiology was one of only three specialties that was not included in the specialty specific analysis because so little IMGs apply. The, <laughs> other, two, the other two specialties are radonc and otolaryngology. What are your thoughts on this? Were you nervous applying? Do you feel like it's an IMG unfriendly field? I was terrified to apply. I was like, I am not going to match. On match day, I was absolutely shaking. Um, I thought that I was going to just get a prelim and then maybe I have to apply next year. I was absolutely horrified just from people. No, cause this past match saw a 30% less applicant pool, but with, but with higher standards and with higher scores and with higher everything. And it was because so many people the year before went unmatched that this year, everyone was just too afraid to apply. Right. Um, I, I don't say don't apply to, I are an IMG. I say, go for it. Um, seeing these stats definitely terrified me, but you know, me and then I think there was one other person who actually matched from IR up in Geisinger in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, we're living examples that it can be done for sure. Uh, I will tell any IMG, if you want to do IR, get it done, do whatever you can do, get those letters, get that step score, get those rotations, excel, shine and do the best you can. Do you think that, IMGs would apply if they had more exposure during either third year or at some point in their life, they saw IR and they were like, Oh, this is cool. That's a great question. And I'm, and I'm glad you reminded me because I was going to say that and I forgot. Um, we don't have any exposure to IR. No. I don't think anyone, when I first saw the IR suite and what it looks like, I was like, this looks like a room from the future. Um, <laughs> and literally look, there's all these cool little gadgets and all these things in this room. And I had no experience to this. I just thought a radiologist was someone who sat at a computer and read MRIs all day. And in some cases that, that might be true, but for IR is in general, we have zero exposure and I kind of just stumbled upon it. I think now it's getting a little bit more popular, but if you can get some experience and go, if you're on a rotation, go, if your patient's going for a splenic embolization or getting a tips procedure, go in and watch it. And if you like that, you should keep at it because these are the really, really cool, very nifty, very crafty procedures that are all interventional. We don't ever, all we do is make a tiny little incision and you know, the femoral vein or the jugular vein, we can do so much stuff to your body. Just do a tiny little nick. It's, yeah. it's honestly unbelievable. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I feel like also when you're in your, like medicine rotation and surgery rotation are both so long, right? They're 12 weeks long for us, minus this pandemic year that has, you know, everything messed up. Normally 12 weeks and 12 weeks, and 12 weeks for uh, surgery and internal medicine. You will have days in IM and in surgery when you're not on the floor and when you're not in the OR, I think this would be a really good opportunity to go down to the IR suite because you're not like, it's like you said, it's very hard to get IR rotations as a student. But if you're, if your hospital has an IR either program or even just department, even if it's just like two or three guys, um, I think, you know, heading down there and just checking it out is a super important part of both medicine and surgery. And if this spikes an interest in you and you're like, oh, actually, I'd rather be down here than upstairs, then, you know, maybe that, is, maybe you could decide, you know, more than three months prior to applying. Exactly. You're exactly. In IR. <laughs> if I had, if I had known that in the beginning, that would have made things a lot easier. 
Yeah, um, yes. I think take advantage of your downtime. If if you're if you have an IR like suite at your institution, I think hanging down there and checking it out, seeing if you're interested is a great way. And if if you're looking for experience or exposure and you you know that you might be interested in IR, these are probably great rotations to take that opportunity to do so. Um, I think that's you, great advice. Did you do a, a diagnostics rotation? I did not actually. I did it at the end of my, actually, excuse me, I did, but it got cut short from COVID. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Yeah, similar. I was there for a week and then they were like, see ya. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, talking about prelim years, you are currently doing a surgery prelim year, correct? Yes, I am. When you applied through ERAS for IR, did you have to apply to prelims separately or were they coupled with your IR uh, programs? Like, did they pick like a prelim for you? Great. So every, almost all of them are all advanced residencies, which means when you match there, you match into your PGY2. Gotcha. And you are responsible for finding a prelim spot anywhere. Um, there's only two or th maybe three categoricals that I actually apply to that include the prelim year into the match. Okay. Um, but I wanted to be, if I wanted to do a prelim year, I wanted to do it at the same hospital. So for all the ones that I really wanted to go to, I also applied to their surgery prelim year. Um, and then I would make separate rank lists for, if I match here, this is where I want to go, like separate supplementary rank lists right. for my prelim year. And for the University of Florida, I said, if I match here, I want to do my prelim year at University of Florida. Right. And, and if not, I assume you would want to do it somewhere nearby. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, so I called the, I sent an email to the program director of surgery at University of Florida and I, and I emailed her and I said, I'm really interested in the IR program here. I'd love to also, you know, maybe do a prelim year here. And she Zoom interviewed me real quick and me and her, we just kind of chit chatted for 15 minutes. She goes, yeah, well, if you match here, we'd love to have you. And that's yeah. pretty much how, that's pretty much how it went. So that's awesome. and I, like I said, I just got real lucky, like getting it all in one here, all in one place, prelim year, IR years. And I live at home too. So that's even better. Yeah, that's even better. Yeah. And that's, that's important too. Like, like I was saying before, networking is something super important, especially in a small field like this. People know one another, just pick up the phone and call, pick I, up the phone yes. and call, shoot an email to someone, even if it's not the program director, they usually have either like a secretary or a coordinator or something um, that you can contact. And they're usually very close with them and great with passing the message along because sometimes program directors are way too busy to answer the phone because don't forget that they not only direct the program, but they are also a physician. So yeah. <laughs> your emails isn't always on the top of their list. Um, but if you can reach out to the coordinator, I think that is reasonable also. You, do you have the choice of applying for prelim in surgery or internal medicine, or you have to do surgery? So for interventional, you have to do surgery. If you yeah. wanted to do diagnostic, you could do an internal medicine year or a transitional year. Um, it's okay. not, if you want to do IR though, it's not, that's, it's not really recommended. And that's just because you need to get, good with your hands need to know how to take care of critically ill surgical patients yeah. because a lot of these other procedures are happening on people who are critically ill yeah. and you need to you need to learn what to happen what happens if someone crashes on the table how to manage these patients and you just need to get good with your hands know how to suture know how to tie yeah. and know how to just maneuver small things in small spaces um medicine is great because you really get to learn all the ins and outs of gi cardio renal and, and really know how to manage these patients um but in terms of working with your hands i think the surgery year is much better yeah, that's a very good point. Um, also, in terms of like the application in general, other than you mentioned step scores weren't that important. What do you feel like was the most, what factor do you feel like carried the most weight basically for the, the interview? The interview in the interview was the most important part. And they even told me at, at the interview, because we base, they go, your resume is kind of getting you through the door. But when you get to the interview, everything else is out the window. Okay. They said, your interview is literally like, your interview makes or breaks it. Um, no, go ahead. No, I was just saying, like in some interviews, they would ask really weird questions. Uh, I had a guy ask me to teach him something that's procedural, but non-medical. And then I had to sit there for a second and I said, okay, let me think about that. And I, I play a few instruments and I play the banjo. And I, I taught him- like, piano, so we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, so I, I taught him how to play um, just a, a basic riff on the banjo just by, you know, just air hands basically. Yeah. And I thought he thought that was really cool. And he thought that it was really unique and it wasn't something that anyone ever, anyone ever taught him. So I, thought, I mean, I thought that made me stand out as well. So yeah. they had to find these little things to kind of put you on the edge of your seat. 
Yeah. But for the most part, all the interviews were just straight conversation, like talk about football, let's talk about golf, or let's talk about, you know, let's see if we have any common interests. Will I like working with you and teaching you for the next five years of my life, you know? <laughs> no, I think that's really important that you brought that up too, is because so many people are like scared of interviews. And as someone who went through like a primary care interview process, um, it was conversational. And I think that it's easy to tell people now that I'm on the other side that like interviews aren't that bad. They're very conversational, but like people who apply for like pretty competitive specialties, I feel like tend not to necessarily like take my advice uh, very seriously because they're like, nah, it has to be like hard questions. So hearing that in interventional radiology, they're also pretty friendly and conversational. Um, I'm glad that you can support my advice. Um, yeah. Um, I think another thing to point out too, is that you were originally interested in doing internal medicine specifically for heme onc. And I tell people all the time, they're like, okay, even if you're interested in like hemonc or GI, like you have to like medicine because you're not interviewing for hemonc or GI, you're interviewing for internal medicine. And if you don't like it, that's not great. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up earlier, actually, because you have to like what you're going to do. And even it took, it took you, you know, kind of by surprise to figure out what you wanted to do, but it's true. Like when you know, you'll know. Um, and the other thing is that people are sometimes like, oh, well, I don't have to do that great on step one. I'm only applying for like internal medicine or family medicine. Like I hate when people say that because- Try the best you can. Right. You still need to know medicine. And also when you apply for fellowship, like if you're dead set on like hemonc, hemonc, you need a good step one score. Like for fellowships, they look at step one and step two scores. They don't look at step three. So 100%. I think that's really, I don't know. I, I'm actually like your, your path to interventional radiology as I think- even more interesting to me than the specialty itself, because it just goes to show like you need to stay open-minded. You need to take advantage of the opportunities you're given and you really need to network. Picking up the phone, I think not enough people do nowadays. Like we're so used to just like emailing and texting and you know, going on social media and contacting people through there, but like you got to pick up the phone and call. I 100% agree and I'll, and I'll tell a little anecdote. When I was in one of my interviews, he turned the computer around yeah. And, and he had his email open on like a side window and I saw how many emails and I saw a couple that said, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm really interested in your program. And I go, oh, my. inbox was filled. You and me and both. <laughs> I think you gave very sound advice. Um, face to face, call them, get your name out there. Let them, let them know you. I absolutely agree. In terms of actually sitting in front of people in interviews, what is the one thing that you think I guess, help you like move yourself up on the rank list, um, either for the advanced year or for the preliminary year? Like what do you think that it was about your interview day that made people really take a liking for you? That's a, that's a great question. And honestly, I don't have the 100% correct answer because I, I, I wish I could read their that. mind. Yeah. I wish I could read their mind. The one thing that I always did is I stuck to my guns in the sense that I didn't try to cater to the interviewer. I wanted to be myself. And I had to know that not only are they interviewing me but also I need to know am I gonna like it where I'm going and if, if someone all they talked about was baseball I don't really like baseball that much and I wouldn't try to pull out baseball facts yeah. out of my out of my head and be like oh I love you know Alex Rodriguez or whatever uh, some, <laughs> the Yan I love the Yankees Derek Jeter, I, the only baseball player I can name <laughs> yeah so I you know that's that's one thing I remember one of the, my interviewers would talk about horses a lot and I said I straight up told her you know I, I think that's great that you love horses I don't know anything about horses <laughs> yeah. um I would love to carry on this conversation with you, but, and I think that took her by surprise that, and I think, I think she was at the end, she was like, you know, I've never really had anyone tell them, tell me straight up. I have no idea, you know, what you're talking about. Okay. And I think sticking to your guns and not really trying to cater for the interviewer and just being yourself actually makes them look at you, you know, in a better light. Cause I'm sure that they, and I'll try to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I agree. I think that you, I always tell people the same thing. Like, not only are they interviewing you, but you're interviewing them. And like, not only do you have to match, but like they have to fill their spots too. And exactly. in programs like, okay, for example, like my program has 55 people. Cool. I'm bound to probably make friends with one of them, but like, if there's only, bless you. If there's Thank only you. two people in your class, you better hope that you have some common interests. So like, don't fake it on ma on interview day because of you, course. you're going to be miserable with one other person. You're going to hate your life. Like, no, thanks. <laughs> Bless you. You good? Yeah, I'm good. It's just allergy season. I tested for Corona negative two days ago, so I'm good to go. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then I guess kind of the last question that I had for you um, in terms of letters of recommendation for your prelim years. I know, I guess this is sort of 
um, not as great of a question for you because you were interested in internal medicine for so long. So obviously, if you were going to apply for a prelim in internal medicine, you had already had your letter secured. But in general, say someone is applying for IR and they need to match into a preliminary surgery program as well. Do you, how do you feel like the letter of recommendation distribution should be? Should you have one or two for um, the prelim surgery year? Should you have one or two for interventional radiology and kind of split them? Or like, does it not matter who the letters are from? So I actually used my IR letter, my surgery letter, and my medicine letter for my surgery prelim. Okay. And, I, and for my experience, it worked out fine. Um, as long as you have a surgeon, a surgery letter. So, and that's a good point. I did say that for IR, you can have a medicine or a surgery. It's always good to have a surgery letter because if you're going to do a surgery P1, you need that. But having an internal medicine letter also is really helpful because surgeons also take care of patients on the floors. They might, you know, do it in a different way, but they need to know that you know how to take care of patients because once you operate on them, they're still under your responsibility once they're admitted to the hospital. Yeah. You still got to manage their, insul you got to manage their glucose, you got to manage their electrolytes, you have to manage their everything. Yeah, I absolutely agree. But it's, you know, I'm so shocked on how much, like on, tr on the trauma floor, how much I have to take care of these patients. It's insane. Once a trauma comes in and they're admitted to our service, I'm, I'm treating their rheumatoid arthritis. I'm treating their, uh, yeah. I'm treating their kidney disease. And, and a lot of these are critically ill patients that we might not have a sick bed upstairs and they're kind of on the floor and they're letting a third week intern basically take care of these patients. And, you know, obviously I have help from my attending and I, and I don't of do course. anything about asking, but it's, it's pretty insane the level, of, the level of care these patients need. And I'm so glad I did it because I really think it's a great learning experience. Yeah, I agree. I'm glad you feel the same also because I, I, don't know, I just, I feel like I want people to know that to take all, no matter what specialty you're interested in, even if it's not a core rotation, like not even just something necessarily as competitive as IR, but even for example, like neurology, neurology for IMGs isn't a core. For US students, it sometimes is, but even if neuro is what you want to do, you still have to take all of your other rotations very seriously. They're called cores for a reason. So because you have to know. Because you have to know the stuff. <laughs> or and at least medicine is so hard. Yeah. Like fine tuning the care of patients on the floor is very difficult. It is. And it's like trying to do it with the least amount of like medications possible because it's 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 honestly it's so hard and like the things that like I forget to do sometimes and like you'll get yelled at by your chief and I'll just write down in my little notebook, don't forget to add Keppra if someone has a, a brain bleed or don't forget to do so-and-so. It's honestly the amount of information that you guys and all doctors have to know is really just outstanding. It's amazing how much we have to know. Yeah, I agree. And that's like, I think it's interesting too that like you mentioned, IR is like a newer residency, whereas it used to be like, you know, radiology and then IR, because I feel like every field is like, we're getting so advanced in terms of research and we're learning so much that I think it's impossible to know absolutely everything. And it's like crazy to see now how like, if you wanna do IR, you don't even have to go through radiology because there's just like so much to know about IR. It's, like obviously you still learn general radiology, but like IR is now it's like own thing. And like, it's, it's just pretty crazy to think about. Like even same with like radonc, like it's no longer just like oncology, it's radiation and oncology. Like it's very specific. It's, own, it's, 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 it's it, is, it is amazing. Because and now IR will never be able to get away from diagnostic radiology in terms of being a separate field because you have to have a good diagnostic background right. in order to be a good interventional radiologist, but they're also so different. Yeah. I'm like, it's, I don't, it's just wild to me, like how much we need to know, but yet like we'll never know. You can't, obviously you can't know everything, but knowing as much as possible is, will help you way more than knowing as little as possible. I agree, because I think sometimes like you know, students don't take their, you know, what, whatever rotation it is that they're not interested in very seriously. And it's, like I said, it's a core for a reason. It's, it's more important than you might think. But like, when you start like managing patients like on your own, you, you start to realize like how important they actually are. Um, At one point, did you ever think, oh shoot, I'm a doctor now, like <laughs> when you um, first started? Yeah, so I think my, the beginning of my schedule was pretty weird. So I was on, my license came a little late because my ECFMG certificate was yeah, late. Okay. So basically they started, we get four weeks of reserve every year. So they started me on a week of reserve, which was nice because then I didn't have to start late. I was just like basically on a week off if they called me and they called me in. If they didn't, they didn't, fine. So I had two weeks of that. And then I had a week of rheumatology, which was like half inpatient, half outpatient, which wasn't bad because like there's a fellow there, there's another resident, there's an attending, like it's, it's a specialty service. So it wasn't like too bad. You were still like going, 
going around with the attending. Um, and clinic is, I feel like where I started to realize like, oh wow, I'm a doctor now. But even so it was like 4th of July week. So it was like kind of a short week and we're in the, like the transition period of people are starting to like patients are starting to come to in office visits now from telehealth. So mm -hmm. it was still like a really weird transition. And although I like did feel like a doctor because I was like in clinic seeing patients on my own, managing them on my own, typing my own notes, things like that. It was just like, kind of, it was like messy still. The floors is where I was really like, Oh my God. <laughs> so this past week I've been like, Oh my God. Like what? <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> and like That's people awesome. are calling me, they're like, Oh yeah. You know, blood pressure high. Like, what do you want to give? And I'm just like, like what do I want to give you? I'm looking around. Like, what do you mean me? Like, what do I want? Right, to give? Like why me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, like, I think the first time I got a phone call, like about like a high blood pressure or like, uh, like a hypoglycemic um, finger stick or a hyperglycemic finger stick for that matter. Um, I think that's when I kind of started to read it when they're just like, okay, critic critically low value. What do you want to do? And I'm just like, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> sure. That's awesome. like, he's hypoglycemic. Give him some juice. I don't know. <laughs> that is a, yeah. I mean, basically that he is, can't give him juice, right? I love, I love those stories. Um, I just think that's such a crazy feeling. And I love hearing people's experiences with that. I think it really hit me was, when I was in the trauma bay and my chief resident had to go on an operative case and like emergently because someone had shot themselves in the leg. So oh. it was basically me in a third year down there and like a bunch of traumas came in and I went over to the, cause we were putting patients in the ED because there was no beds. And then she was screaming in pain. The nurse goes, what do you want to give her for pain? And I, and I look around and I go, you're talking to me? <laughs> like, <laughs> I go, you're, ta you're talking to me, right? She goes, yeah, what do you want to give him? I go, 50 a fentanyl, just give it like, and, they went yeah. and goes, okay, drew it up, gave it to her. She goes, okay, I feel better. And I thought, oh my God, we're yeah. doctors now. Like, holy it is, crap. It's pretty exhilarating. But like, the, I feel like my experience was similar to yours. Like when I got the call, I like, I like stuttered and I was like, wait, like, are you calling the right number? Like, I was like, wait, no, yeah, you're talking <laughs> to me. Oh my God. I have to order something like now. <laughs> yeah, it was like, a, it's definitely a feeling of shock. I think like graduation is like great. It's like, Oh yeah. Like I'm officially a doctor, but like it doesn't actually hit you until oh, it does not hit you. you and it's like, what do you want to do? Once you like wait, that summer, but before residency, you're not really a doctor yet. Like, you no. Had... no, you're just like hanging out. Yeah. You forgot you're just hanging before. out. But once you're on the, once you're on the floors and they're start calling you, like, what do we get for the blood pressure? What do we get for this? Like, that's when you're really in the thick of it. Yeah, it's like deer in headlights because you're like getting six calls about like various things. And they're just like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? I'm like, I can't think. I don't know. <laughs> but you're going to finish and you're going to be like, you're going to be an amazing doctor because, you know, going through this and trying to manage all these patients at once, like you're going to be able to tackle anything later. Yeah, I feel, I feel, I feel like that's like the best part about residency is like you are put in that very scary position, but that's how you're going to learn. Like you, you're never going to forget how to like give whatever pain medication you gave. Like you're never going to forget. That always sticks with me. I am never going to forget like what I gave her blood pressure the first time. I'm never going to forget the first time I put in a sliding scale. And I'm never going to forget the first time I had to give someone apple juice because their blood sugar was too high. <laughs> apple juice, like the doctor's secret formula is just like apple juice. That's great. Yeah. Just put it in an order. For, you, the best part is you don't even have to put it in order for apple juice. You, have you can to just tell them give them apple juice. Want, but you don't for apple juice. You just call the nurse and be like, hey, give them some apple juice. I'm glad to hear you're enjoying residency so far. Are you as tired as I am? You've been on. I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. I heard it only gets worse and like it starts to accumulate. I slept for 10 hours tonight. I've only been doing this for five days. So I can't wait to see how I feel. Yeah. And the, the, the worst part is like after your day's off, you're so tired in your day off that like you don't even want to do anything. You just want to sit and lay in bed. Yeah, that was me today. I haven't left my house. Yeah, I mean, I left my house, but like very begrudgingly just to go get like Starbucks and come back. Like, yeah, okay, I lied. Actually, yeah, I did go to the grocery store to buy something for dinner tonight, but that was it. And so other it, than that, that's about it, It's two blocks away. I walked four blocks total. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your body will get used to it and, you know, it, will, it won't get any better, but I think you'll be more like, when you first start waking up at 5, 6 a.m., obviously it's going to suck, but then later on you're just like, okay, this is like, this is what I have to do. Like, it's just kind of like a normal thing. Yeah, I agree. And I think also like as the year goes on, like we'll get faster. Like obviously we're still trying to like learn how to use like the EMR and just like the nuances of like the, in the institution itself. And oh I think like, once you yeah. start to know those things and like you learn your way around and like all of that, like you can, you can come in kind of like a half an hour later or something and you may not have to stay as long because you'll be more efficient and things like that. And hopefully that helps. Um, trying to figure out how to write notes and like put it in this and like do smart phases in Epic. Yeah. It, that's always, they use Epic at the hospital and trying yeah. to figure out Epic was just, it was a headache and a half. 
same because there's so many ways to like it's great because like it's easy but the problem is there's so many ways to see everything yeah and, and you have to figure out that, like, the fastest most efficient way to do it like which button is yeah. actually the most efficient and you can't teach someone electronic medical record on like a on like a lecture and this is how you do this and i'm like i'm not gonna remember any of this you have to I'm just get in there for orientation you had a lecture on emr also yeah and it was absolutely Thanks. pointless it was it was the most useless hour like I'm sitting there and I just put them because it was on Zoom actually. I didn't I didn't See? go and and they were asking questions and I was just hitting A for everyone because I don't know. I had no idea. But then once you get into it, you start, you know, working through the you EMR. Do it. You can't exactly. tell people by the click. I'm gonna forget. I'm Great sorry. that you're enjoying it too though. I'm glad to hear. Yeah, it's been fun so far. Scary, but it's been fun and I don't know. It's nice. I'm tired, but like it's great. Yeah, well, I hope I answered all your questions. Yeah, you did. Uh, you w beyond exceeded them. And I'm happy that you took the time to do this today because I feel like I learned a lot about IR and it was super nice to catch up with you and chat. Oh, of course, yeah. See, and, your, um, like, like the last time I saw you, maybe was the ACP conference. It was, that was the last and time I saw you. And you were like trying to do HEMOC. So that's why when I was like, oh, he matched into IR, like great. I remember I was talking about that. I remember, food. yeah. It changed very drastically after that. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. Because ACP was in, what, what, do you remember what month that was? It was either April or May. So that's what I mean. Like, you literally changed, like, right after I saw you. Yeah, like, literally, like, a month or a month and a half after I switched it up. So Yeah, that's so crazy. Good for you. I'm so glad. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you again for coming on today. No, of course. If you have any questions, please feel free.